Please welcome our panellists, Co-Chief Executive Officer of Investcorp, Hazem Ben Gassam, Chief Executive Officer of Fidelity International, Anne Richards, Group Chief Executive of Standard Chartered, Bill Winters, Founder, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Hill House Investments, Lei Zhang, and our moderator, Senior Executive Editor for Bloomberg News, Sarah Wells. Right, thank you and hello. Uh, when it comes to financing the new economy, there are no shortage of large numbers to throw around. I think we've all heard the $100 trillion figure for net zero, then we can layer on you know, building more resilient supply chains, new tech stacks to digitize businesses, other aspects of ESG, and on and on. But our panelists today represent some of the biggest names in public and private market investing, as well as banking, so they're all gonna play a key part in getting us there. Uh, so let's, let's dive straight in. Uh, Leigh, I might start with you. Uh, you said previously that your investment philosophy can be boiled down to doing things that make sense. <clears throat> and you raised $18 billion last year, so that gives you a lot of room to do things. But what new economy investments do you think make the most sense, i.e. where are you actively looking to allocate capital? Sure, sure, absolutely. The, uh, if you look at the, uh, the whole climate technology space, particularly on the supply chain, I think there's a lot to do. And uh, we are pretty excited uh, earlier in the breakout session, we talked about uh, the technology and innovation that can really drive down the cost. You look at the solar industry, the last 10 years, essentially drive down the unit cost by 90%. We expect another 50% down in the next 10 years. Similarly, you could see that happening in the uh, solar, in the battery storage. So we think there are a lot we can do uh, as uh, private investors, as uh, the uh, government working together uh, to help with that supply chain, help with that technology, help with the inno innovation. Yeah. All right, and I might, I might come to you next. Um, to, talk, to talk around how you balance your fiduciary, fiduciary duties to investors, i.e. to maximize returns, make as much money as possible, um, relative to the broader principle of sustainability, and, and I ask this in particular because ESG investing as a concept is coming under increasing criticism in the US, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and investments in fossil fuels are rising again. So I guess I would ask, is, is the sustainable investing movement uh, losing momentum? I think it's, you can clearly see that we're dealing with a very <coughs> different set of external dynamics to the ones we were dealing with you know, at the last COP. COP26 in Glasgow last year, and as fiduciaries, our role is really to look after other people's money, our clients' money, um, in the way that they want us to. And what we have seen is some differentiation, depending on where you are in the world, about what people think is the right thing to do in order to exercise that fiduciary responsibility. But we've certainly, within our client base, we've not seen any let up in momentum in terms of their desire to make sure that the fiduciary responsibilities that they give us, that we act on their behalf, include thinking about how the investments they make are sustainable over the longer term and not just profit maximizing in the short term. So, you know, I think there can be differences in time horizon about the way you measure those financial returns, but I think at the heart of it, investments, companies that are exploitative, for example, of the environment, we know that over the long run, those will, and it might be the very long run, but those will deliver lower returns. So it's more a question of a balance of, of, of timing than it is, I think, of financial returns versus sustainability. And certainly the broad base of our clients would, would support that, albeit there are slightly different nuances in different, in different parts of the world, for sure. Mm -hmm. And what are, what are those nuances? Sorry? What are those nuances? Well, in, in, in the US, clearly, you, 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 know, you have had some, um, a, 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 it is a minority of the client base thinking that the fiduciary responsibility should be to maximize financial returns, which is fair enough. That doesn't mean that you can't have a sustainability objective alongside that, but nonetheless, that there is a primacy of financial returns. It's very, very clear from our European client base 
that they regard sustainability as an absolutely inherent part mm -hmm. of delivering long-term financial returns. So, you know, it is quite, you know, there are those nuances. By the way, there are US investors who would agree with that. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting dynamic. And here in Asia, I think it, in Asia, the, the part of sustainability that is that really, I think, environmental is that climate-related part of the sustainability agenda. And we're seeing an increase in our clients here in Asia talking to us about what is the right way to reflect their concerns in the portfolios that we build for them. So I think, you know, if you, if you just break it up into those three regional blocks, you are seeing, you know, some, some differences in approach, but the overall momentum, at least from what we see in our client base, is, is broadly unchanged. So Sarah, if I can add mm, sure. to that point. I think whether we are an investor or a restaurant owner or a minister or a taxi driver, we need to conduct ourselves as a responsible human being, period. That responsibility shouldn't be a question mark of returns. If we want to generate high returns, I think we can all go on the cocaine trade and probably make significantly more than what we're making, but we don't. Why? Because we're responsible beyond the legal requirement. And I think that principle of being a responsible human being needs to be carried in every single sector and in every single, if we are investors, we get to act responsibly. Now, Perhaps there are some extreme interpretations of ESG, but I think if we all start with that principle of we're going to do what is right as a human being, as a responsible person on this planet, to our families, to our children, what have you, then I think we should be fine. And I think that principle I don't think anyone will disagree with. But perhaps some interpretations of what does ESG investing stand for is perhaps have gone far. And I'm going to use the example of fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. I, for one, I'm so thankful for the fossil fuel industry in the last 150 years that it has gotten us to where we are today. That is the reality. If it wasn't for the fossil fuel industry, I think the world wouldn't be where it is today. Now, but again, as humans, we evolve, and that technology is becoming more and more obsolete. The same way a, um, a steam engine became obsolete, and more and more now the combustion engine is becoming obsolete, and other technologies are evolving, but it shouldn't be vilified in a manner which is perhaps unfair. And we humans, we have evolved. And that, uh, that journey, we learn from it. And I hope this journey from fossil fuel to renewable energy will happen in that manner. But it needs to be a transition as opposed to something which you have to stop right now and you're going to be vilified if you do put a penny into fossil fuel and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, Bill, I'd like to pick that up from a banking perspective. Uh, I understand from a brief discussion backstage that you may dispute this figure, but I have seen statistics showing that, that bank lending to fossil fuel companies is up about 15% in the first nine months of this year uh, to more than $300 billion. So are you concerned about the level of commitment across the banking system to, to net zero? Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the world's commitment to net zero because I think everybody is finding it hard, both technically and financially. Uh, but the... I, I, I take a look at Standard Charter Bank. Uh, we've increased our loans to organizations like uh, Saudi Aramco and British Petroleum. Why? Uh, we're financing a green hydrogen project in Saudi Arabia. And we're financing you know, billions of dollars of renewables that are being funded and technically driven by, by the big fossil fuel producers and carbon emitters. Uh, they're trying to do the right thing, uh, obviously completely subscribe to the transition theory uh, and, and reality, which is we can't get off fossil fuels today. Uh, we can redeploy that cash flow into uh, the, the most socially useful thing that we can, and that's quite natural for, for energy companies. So that the, I think one of the big problems we've got right now is that the investment into, into uh, fossil fuel production has plummeted. Uh, including oil and gas. Obviously, coal is, is, has decreased significantly. Uh, coal is, is, is unnecessary, and I think the International Energy, Energy Agency has been very clear that, that new coal production is unnecessary to satisfy world demand. Unfortunately, ongoing development of oil and gas is necessary, unless we're going to stifle the opportunity for, in particular, <laughs> developing economies to grow. Uh, it's the only access uh, to energy that they've got, and these are, economies are still growing, many of them in this neighborhood right here. So. Uh, that part of the transition, and it's part of the transition that we're financing, is to uh, to go from the, the, the dirtiest fuels to the uh, to the cleaner fuels, and then to renewables. Uh, sometimes you can leapfrog straight there, but there's just not enough solar. I mean, it's, it's wonderful the, the the picture of the. I think that's the project we financed in Indonesia, 
uh, with floating, uh, yeah, but floating solar farm in Java. And uh, yeah, that's great. But there are as many solar cells being produced right now as can be installed. There's, there's, you can't, we can go faster over time, not that much faster. And uh, the banking industry will finance that. There's not much investment going into fossil fuel production, and that's leading to structurally higher prices. Uh, if you're a coal producer right now, you are minting money, right? Why? Because there's been no new investment in coal. The price of coal is four times what it was three years ago, and they're generating grotesque profits. Now, should those companies be diverting those, uh, that cash flow into renewables? Yeah, they should. In some cases, they are, but not consistently. And that's one of the big opportunities that we've got. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, on balance, the, the responsible thing to do right now is allocate more to fossil fuels? No. The, the responsible thing to do right now is to allocate more and more into transition finance. And that's the $300 billion that Standard Chartered has committed to delivering into transition finance. Uh, but that transition uh, will be moving from the dirtiest forms of fuel to ever cleaner forms of fuel, eventually to <coughs> purely renewable power. Mm -hmm. Sarah, if I, can, if I can come in on that as well, because I think it's a, it's a really important point. If you look out to 2050, 2060, there is pretty broad agreement at a political level of what the direction of travel is and what the aspiration is that we need to get to in roughly that time frame. The challenge for all of us is there are multiple different paths to get there and you have to figure out what the consequences of those different paths are. So even on the subject of thermal coal, and you know, we've set ourselves targets of how we want to really help the firms we invest in get completely away from thermal coal. If you're sitting in a developing country where your only local source, cheap source of energy is thermal coal, well, there's a duty on everybody else to help find alternatives to that. Otherwise, the economically sensible thing for minimizing harm to your local population, who will otherwise be in fuel poverty, is just to exploit the thermal coal. So we've got to figure out what is the optimal path. And there is more than one of those, potentially, but we've got to get on that path and accept it's not going to go in a straight line. And you know, you've seen from the events this year and the dislocation in energy markets, fuel poverty has become very real for a lot more people. And that's something that we, we, we can't just ignore in a straight line drive to 2050, we've got to figure out the very difficult way of navigating what are a set of difficult trade-offs and how do we make them in a way that's fair and proportionate, but nonetheless gets to where we need to get to in, in 2050. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to I switch text slightly now because we've been talking about what, what to do with capital. Um, I'd also like to talk around where that, some of that capital will come from, so maybe Hazem, a question for you. Um, what role do you think private wealth will play in financing the new economy? Uh, and, and also, what does that do to risk appetite? Yeah. Is it, d does it change the equation? Yeah. So, so we as a firm for now four decades, an anchor part of our um, capital into alternative investments came from private wealth. Let me just throw some numbers out there first. Uh, today, private wealth accounts for about 120 trillion globally. But here's the interesting fact. 60 trillion out of that 120 over the next 30 years, 30 to 40 years, is going to transition to the next generation. So are these lucky bunch? They're usually between <laughs> the age of 30 and 50. Um, they tend to be higher on the risk profile than their, uh, their prior generation, which means they have a higher appetite, not for bonds, not for T-bills, but perhaps experiment with private equity, with venture capital with new territories which they haven't been exposed to in the past. I think the days where um, you know, I work, I made some money, I put it with a, with a mutual fund or I put it with my asset manager, perhaps are, are going to evolve in an interesting way. Um, now, we see this live with our, with our, uh, with our clients. Uh, the profile of them tends to be very, they ask a lot of questions, and they kind of know it all. You know, in terms of, you know, kind of risks and, oh, Indonesia, great place, you know, we should be there, you know, kind of Vietnam, oh, be careful. So, and that's fine. Uh, but also the very interesting aspect about them is they're very, very digitally savvy. And sometimes they prefer less to come to a wood paneled office and sitting in front of the financial manager to tell them about the portfolio and more, show me the app. 
and you know what, kind of, I want to see little videos of the CEOs of these two businesses you bought, and let me make the decision how much I'm going to allocate here and there. So I think digitization will play a very, very important part in the future of capital, particularly going into the private markets, which we kind of know. Um, and that new generation is more vocal. And last thing I should say is that new generation is very, um, very clear on using their capital to support whatever concepts they believe in or principles they feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably will be the biggest push in favor of um, um, the renewable energy kind of uh, marketplace, I think, because that's a big portion of that 120 trillion will be in the hands of individuals who have strong views about the environment, around the future, about around um, DNI, around what proper firms should be looking at. And that's great. I think that is an, that democratization of um, private markets is perhaps a, a healthy evolution in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what, if I could add on that, uh, whether, um, uh, whether uh, would a better designed products with renewable for private wealth actually for our institutions could be possible. I was thinking about sort of exchange-based infrastructure risk products and things like that that give some stability but also help build on the sort of the renewable infrastructure that uh, Bill and Anne talked about because you really think about uh, the investing in the whole space, it's not only about technology and supply chain, it's a lot about the bottlenecking, that whole uh, logistics, port facilities, uh, infrastructure around that. I think that if we could work on some products, you know, I don't know, put on some bank leverage or something for private wealth, put some economic incentive for them, but well design something uh, good for the industry. And uh, a second thought on this would be sort of the soft infrastructure around the whole green financing that we've been looking for more sort of data-driven analytical measurement, sort of more dynamic measurement companies that businesses that could say, hey, this is the standard we are using, but it's not a static standard. So it's saying it's pulling all the data, has algorithm working on this uh, uh, rating agency. It's a set of the whole infrastructure is needed for this. Yeah. And so that's second part. And then lastly, the final part of whole green investments is on this education. I think that, you know, you think about this la new labor force uh, has to be put in place and, uh, um, it's just I'm not sure the current educational system is, is that productive in terms of bringing the newest technology, newest uh, skill sets, particularly on the vocational schools. Mm -hmm. uh, that I'm not talking about university level advanced labs. I'm really talking about, I mean, solar installation <laughs> agents or <laughs> that uh, the workers and on um, um, doing your battery change. And that was earlier hearing people telling me how, many, how much time they have to wait just <laughs> and uh, even in the winter for them to switch on a uh, uh, new battery storage or in inverter or getting the solar installed. So I think having that, you know, I'm looking at, again, I'm looking at some technology helping that. I'm looking at some vocational school run by private entrepreneurs. I think those are really promising. I mean, I look at it, so one of actually a tech portfolio company that we have is really interesting. What they do is that they try to sort of uh, break down all the knowledge of installation and services into 30 seconds TikTok video. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you just swipe it yourself <laughs> and like, uh, and after you do that, actually you look at the, your camera and you do a recording and uh, phone gonna listen using AI, whether you have the right keywords or whether you're smiling. <laughs> so, so I think having that sort of vocational training, helping bring up the skill sets mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for yeah, the human, soft infrastructure. Human, human capital is a huge, a huge, huge part of this equation. It's, it's Agree. a huge Agree. deal. That's, can can yeah. I come back to your comment, your earlier comment on private wealth though? Um, were you, because were you, obviously Hill House currently raises funds from institutional investors, were you implying that you'd like to find a way to also target private wealth clients? Or is oh, yeah. Uh, right now. No, 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 absolutely. We'd love to. We'd love to. I think we, 
which you need to find your really, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, the right products that I think that's relevant, that we can serve well, and we can really build in that capabilities. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and I'd like to situate this discussion of how to finance the new economy um, in the context of some of the other current economic challenges that we are facing. Obviously, we've talked a lot um, at, the, at the forum so far about interest rates rapidly rising, recession risks, uh, and also the risks of decoupling, you know, of the, of the creation of economic blocks led by the US and China. Uh, and I think that risk remains uh, despite the, the green shoot of Monday's uh, Xi mm. Biden meeting. Uh, so, so, Bill, as, as a global bank, you know, with a significant China-facing business, how do you think about the decoupling issue? You know, o over the long term, I guess, how comfortable will the West be in financing China and China-led projects? So I am also encouraged by that green shoot that you mentioned. I think it's, uh, it's certainly a sign that th th there's a will not to have things get worse. And we were concerned about the, the perpetual escalation cycle. Uh, but certainly President Biden was, was very clear this is going to be intense competition for a long time. Uh, but our economies are also in incredibly intertwined. So the idea that we could decouple was never really very practical. And uh, it would have been extremely costly to, uh, to both sides. So I, I don't think we ever thought that that was a likely outcome, but there's always the possibility of an accident or, or a misjudgment. You know, perhaps uh, there was a... Or, or decoupling in specific sectors, right? Like what we're seeing with chips. I think the, 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 the focus on, on national, concern, national security considerations and supply chain security considerations, that's structural. We've had a, we've had a massive change. Uh, we know that that's going to affect the way supply chains work around the world. Uh, we know that that's structurally inflationary, uh, and that's, I think, one of the big challenges that central banks have right now, but that's a different discussion. The, um, the, the, the period of intense competition, for, from our perspective, is fine. We actually love competition uh, because it makes everybody uh, up their game. It makes everybody a little bit better. Uh, China is, is opening up. They're opening up very fast. I mean, the reason that our profits in China, despite all this COVID stuff, are up 30% year on year is because China is opening up. Uh, and, uh, and that's going to keep on going. Uh, and China is going to take steps to make the RMB a, a more interesting currency in which to conduct trade, uh, <laughs> including uh, digital versions, fiat versions, uh, cross-border arrangements like the, the, the M-Bridge or with, with, with Hong Kong, China, Thailand, and, and the UAE, which will be expanded further, I'm sure, once they get it working. Uh, and that will actually increase the interconnectedness uh, between, call it East and West, although a lot of the interesting relationships are obviously in the East. With, uh, with Korea and Japan, uh, for starters. And that, uh, so I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the, uh, the, the return to structural growth in China. Obviously, they have to put the COVID restrictions behind them. Uh, they think they've also, the other green shoots that we've seen in the last week were in the commercial real estate sector, where there's a, an attempt to stabilize. I'm not sure it's yet at the point of revitalizing the sector, but it's certainly stabilizing, and that's also important. Those are the two big obstacles to, uh, to inward investment to China. Uh, there are others that, that China will work through. And uh, I, dare I say it, the, uh, the outcome of the midterm elections in the U.S. is also helpful uh, because it provides a, at least a little bit of a sense that there can be a, 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 an element of centrist continuity. Even if you know, the next president is, is a Republican, it seems a little bit less likely that it's a dogmatic Republican and a little bit more likely uh, that it's a... Uh, somebody who uh, might continue uh, the policies of the current administration. So I, I think that the, the things are shaping up uh, in, in a reasonably encouraging way, and uh, we're continuing with our investments in China and the U.S. and connecting the two uh, as much as we ever have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Anne, in, in what's been a, a, tough mar a tough year for equity markets worldwide, um, Chinese stocks in Hong Kong have been among the worst, the worst hit. Uh, and foreign investors have pulled uh, $176 billion out of onshore Chinese stocks and bonds in the first nine months of the year. So uh, have you been selling too, firstly? And secondly, uh, how should we read the recent rebound? Is this a, is this a good time to buy? It's, it's very interesting because the dynamics in Asia versus the dynamics in the US and Europe are quite, quite different. And we are more positive on Asia as a region, both from a market perspective um, as well as from a flow perspective for 2023. We, we, we can certainly see increasing um, interest, if not action yet, on region as a whole, including China, as we look into 2023, partly because I think people are beginning to see the other side of some of the real estate 
challenges, but also there's a lot of optimism aware, about where China is in its own interest rate um, policy cycle and the benefits that that will bring for the region as well as the kind of gradual opening up which everyone is, is hopeful for. So I think that as a, 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 as a scene set probably sets um, Asia in general and China as part of that up for a more positive an earlier, if you like, rebound in sentiment than perhaps we're seeing in other, in other parts of the world. Uh, I think there's, there's another quite important point that I want to just come back on between the conversation you and Bill were having just now, though, which is around um, that supply chain point and whether, you know, how vulnerable the supply chain is. Because I think one of the things that we've seen from the conversations that we've had with um, a lot of our companies through the pandemic is not because of the geopolitics per se, but because of the unexpected dislocation that happened during the pandemic as ports shut down, as transportation systems shut down. Companies were unaware of their single points of failure in that supply chain. And, and, and effectively, the way companies were operating on a just-in-time basis relied on insurance to take away the worst-case scenario. And actually, that proved quite difficult in some instances because of the pandemic. What we're seeing now is, I think, supply chain design, which has some optionality in it. Now, it's interesting, though, you said it was inflationary. I think it's quite interesting when you think completely through cycle, whether it will be inflationary or whether it's just better protected against you know, the, the, the sh it might be more expensive year by year, but over the totality of the cycle, if you're avoiding the really big dip downs, I'm not so clear that it is, but I think the profile of expense in that. So, you know, I think that it's supply chain redesign, that idea of optionality, more of a matrix approach to build better resilience into the system, I think is one of the benefits, if I can say that, that has come out of what we've all learned and what we see in, as I say, the companies we invest in over the last... And, and which region is the, is the biggest winner out of what you're just describing, given that we're currently here in Singapore? Is it, is it ASEAN or is it somewhere else? Well, I, th I, I, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I don't think we particularly see it um, as, sim you know, as simplistically as that, but I think you have seen, particularly in Asia, ASEAN realising that it can have a greater share of the value chain in some instances than it has historically had. So I think you are seeing some shift in investment that might have historically all been optimized around one single site, perhaps being spread more widely across the region. But I think that's probably true in, in Europe and you're seeing it down into Latin America as well to an extent. So I think it's, um, I think it's probably the case that some of the smaller markets might find this as an opportunity to get involved in global supply chains in a way that they maybe didn't have the opportunity before. But I think it will be gradual and I think it will be quite spread. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I'll, I'll chime in because I've, I mean, you might expect me to say this, but ASEAN is booming. India is booming. Uh, Korea will benefit. Mm -hmm. Japan will benefit, in a, but in smaller ways. Uh, but this part of the world is absolutely the, the, the growth engine. The U.S. is remarkably resilient and very, very strong. So I, 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 obviously you can tell by my accent where I'm from. Uh, I'd never count the U.S. out. Uh, but growth is rotating to this part of the world. And, uh, and, and the, the connection to the U.S. will remain very strong. Uh, Singapore has, has always had and will continue to have a very central role to play in that. So I think Singapore will be a huge beneficiary and is extremely well positioned for this shift. But, uh, Obviously, the, the manufacturing is going to be sitting in, in the, in the neighbouring countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Hazem, you are increasing your China footprint, I believe. Um, InvestCorp recently announced a partnership for a new Greater Bay Fund. Can you tell us about the rationale for doing that? Um, and any details, you know, when, when's your targeted close? What yeah. kind of things are you going to buy? So first, it is, um, it is sad to see the decoupling between the US and China. Um, when you look at the world's two largest economies, you would have loved that there is a very harmonious relationship which will benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. Now, if I have to choose from the US versus China, you can't choose. That's the reality. You've got to be as active in North America as in the US as you are in China. Why is that? I think every single one in this room probably can have made money in the US in some shape or form. It is the most resilient market. It always bounces back quickly, and it's got liquidity. 
the three anchor ingredients for an investor to make money. Okay. We have had our ups and downs, but we have consistently made money in the US, whether it's private equity, whether it's real estate, whether it's credit, and what have you. And that will continue in our professional lifetime. Okay. So in that respect, as a global investor, regardless <coughs> your political views, act, uh, a presence or a, an allocation to North America is very important in your portfolio. On the other hand, China is attractive, but for very different reasons. China, in a way, is that kind of um, that growth capital story that has been growth capital for the last 20 years and continues to be the growth capital for the next 10 years, or sorry, 20 years or plus. So in that respect, it's got some fantastic momentum, dynamics, and kind of macro factors that it's very difficult to ignore. And in that respect, I think it is quite important. Now for us, why the GBA? Uh, I should say before I talk about the GBA, one observation which, I, which we feel is gonna be a big part in the next uh, decade is inward China investment. And we think that's gonna significantly improve, enhance the tech universe within China. We believe like in the next few decades, um, whatever you see this tech phenomenon that has happened in the US in the last 40 years, there's probably we're start seeing the birth of that in China. And that's why if you ask us, we're probably kind of uh, uh, tech venture capital investing in China by Chinese LPs and investors locally, I think is gonna be a big part and I hope we can be a participant in it. Greater Bay Area, um, I think most of you here probably know more about it than I do. Um, the size of Germany, the population of Germany and probably the uh, industrial hub for, uh, industrial and technology hub for China. Um, uh, for us, it reminds me when I started in private equity in Europe 30 years ago, it feels like Europe 30 years ago. Just getting started, you know, kind of there's a lot of pluses and minuses and government interference and what have you, but it's okay. And in a way, um, we feel that fast forward two decades, that's probably going to be one of the most exciting and active private equity markets in the world. Um, we're very thrilled to see a lot of private wealth. Uh, particularly out of Hong Kong, family offices, who share that enthusiasm and that patriotism to be one of the active investors in that region. Yeah. If I could add, I think the, if the US and China are working together or even compete on some of the areas such as, you know, say, who come up the fast on um, climate technology, mRNA, it's, it's a good thing for the world in the way of collaboration or competition that uh, uh, working together to solve the world problem. We simply put that uh, climate had no borders and uh, cancer had no borders, right? So if uh, something that would be great, we invest on both sides and we look at uh, uh, their entrepreneurship on both sides. And the uh, increasingly, we're actually seeing uh, in China, we're seeing just very traditional investment opportunity. I completely agree with you earlier said that uh, businesses that could be just Basic businesses could be a uh, shoe retailer, could be drugstore chain, or could be uh, vet clinics that we think that you could actually leverage technology to make it better, to make a store more efficient, you know, how to uh, make the experience better, to make the consumer journey much better. It works on both sides, and we are seeing that we have consumer investments across US, China, and Europe that behind the similar philosophy, how do you make that a consumer journey in a complete uh, and uh, closed loop way? So I think there's a lot we could do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can, I, can I just follow up on that, sort of thinking about Hill House's corporate history, I guess? You know, obviously you have very strong Chinese roots and you've grown into an Asian and a global player, but what you just said, does that imply you, you will deploy as much capital in China as you have previously? Well, we look for where the best opportunities are. I think there's a lot of things that you could do. And I think, again, you, you, you just take a different set of lens. The lens is where you could add value, where the opportunities, you know, on the consumer technology, we see the, again, like the farmer's store we talked about, that's just uh, wonderful to apply some of the technology to make the retailers uh, more efficient. It could happen in China, could happen in, in Vietnam, could happen in Indonesia, could happen in other places. I think it's all pretty exciting. I think there's a lot of things that can leverage technology, make it better. I think the one particular point I want to emphasize is this whole idea of technology just being a creative disruptor, but you could actually leverage that to make an enabler. 
So how do you, particularly as a private equity firm, when you buy out companies, how do you leverage technology, say, hey, to make it more efficient, but also trying to sort of educate your workforce, make them more efficient, make them participate in that growth of the companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm conscious that we're, we're nearly out of time, and I wanted to touch on something we haven't uh, discussed so far, which is crypto. Um, I can imagine, you know, if, if, if depending on the timing and the speakers of a, a panel called Financing the New Economy, you know, this could have been a long discussion about how much of that financing would be on a blockchain and what that would look like, uh, but the industry is in, is in crisis right now. So, so I want to ask, and, and any of you can answer, you know, is this the moment that institutional investors sort of pick the low and sense the opportunity and, and buy more heavily into, into crypto? Or is this the moment where institutional investment in crypto dies? Um, happy, sorry, Anne, you go. Well, I, I, I think it's the wrong question in a way, because I think certainly from you know, wh wh where I sit, and I'm guessing sort of Bill and uh, some of the others, maybe too, the really interesting thing about the evolution of crypto was not a whole bunch of different coins that were created. It's actually the infrastructure that it sits underneath it and the transformative, the transformative effect that distributed ledger technology could have on a big chunk of the financial system supply chain. Because one of the things that I find so fascinating about the way that the financial infrastructure of the world has been set up is it's very, very analog. I mean, take something as simple as the settlement periods on exchanges. Now, you know, they're still measured in days. Really, in this day and age, they shouldn't be. And the, the interesting impact of distributed ledger technology, blockchain or others, is that the disruptive power in that financial system and the potential to remove an awful lot of friction in that financial system, I think is immense. So, I think crypto gets the headlines. I think the progress on finding the right use cases for the infrastructure continues. And that has still enormous potential to be used across all of the financial of the yeah. financial industry. So it's possible to separate those two things, the kind of market yes. chaos from, from yes. the underlying work. Yes. No, but, but you can separate them. And it's completely right. The, uh, the, the infrastructure is extremely powerful and will be deployed. But let's not count out the cryptocurrencies, which is one application. You know, Bitcoin is trading at $17,000. Right? There's just been a seismic event, absolutely seismic, on top of a series of seismic events. It's not going away. You know, there's appetite in the world for a non-fiat currency. It's not going to take over the world, in my opinion. Uh, but there's a role to play. Institutional investors are already there and will be there ongoing. So let's make sure that we support it properly. What's going to happen? All of that stuff, that ecosystem, is going to come into the regulated institutional environment because it's just too risky to sit out with a bunch of cowboys who, uh, who have managed to blow themselves up. Mm -hmm. And Hazem, uh, I know you, you, you had a view on this. Um, well, I, I, I agree with what Dan said. I think the uh, crypto gets the headline, but really it's the uh, blockchain technology, which is uh, uh, it's a must for the future. You know, it will facilitate us moving to a paperless economy and also one where we don't measure things in days, but in seconds. And I think that is a must. So in that respect, you know, kind of uh, the capital that flew into the broader crypto definition is OK because it helped create a platform or an infrastructure which will be very helpful for the future. Now, uh, as any digital currency also, it's also the way of the future. Whether it's uh, Bitcoin or, I don't know, dollar coin, whatever it is. But I think this is where uh, regulators need to play an active role uh, in regulating that industry in exactly the same way that um, every other industry is regulated. I think in the US they made a decision uh, nine months ago that the um, not the SEC, but the um, Commodities in a, the Commodities Commission, Commission, which would be mm -hmm. the one that's going to regulate uh, cryptocurrencies. It raised a lot of question marks in my mind, you know, kind of because um, uh, how it is being perceived today as a commodity as opposed to anything else. But I think it's a very, very important part of the future. And um, um, I mean, we all remember the dot-com crash in 2000, uh, but also going back to the Black Monday in the 20s, that was also the industrial sector crash. So all these new kind of hyper sectors when I first get started, you've got this overexcitement hype and then kind of there's a correction and then we learn from it and we regulate. So perhaps we are in that period of learning from it. 
as institutional investors, to answer your direct question, should institutional investors go into crypto, the currency itself? Um, I would be cautious myself. I <laughs> think as institutions, you've got fiduciary responsibilities to a whole slew of investors, and on a risk measure, on a risk reward basis, it um, I don't think it's there yet. Okay. I, I would add that I agree. I think this is just so early, such early innings, it just has huge, still has a lot of potential, I believe, ahead of that. But I wanted to add that it's like what I observe, it's just a lot of great talents coming to the industry. I think, you know, if you could follow the talents, look at what they do, what is the problem they try to solve, there's a number of issues like cross-border e-wallet. There's like, a, a, you know, settlement, trading. The whole fintech infrastructure was so antique Right, so there's a lot you could do. I, I'm, I'm a believer on innovation. I think there are a lot could, be, could happen in mm -hmm. the space. So those innovations can, can live beyond crypto. Yes. I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad we have- And follow the talents. <laughs> Got it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we have an optimistic note to end on. Uh, thank you all very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.